Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for watching. This show is all about giving you insights and showcasing brands that help you to live your best life and give you confidence. As always, I want to kickstart your morning with some motivational advice to help you to feel inspired and energized to start your day. Today, I want to talk about understanding that it's only through our own growth and transformation that we can inspire others. So often in life, we try to change people and force them to see things our way. We pour hours of our time and effort into desperately pushing and hoping that they will change, not realizing that true and lasting change comes from a deep willingness within ourselves and not from external factors. The next time you find yourself trying to desperately change or help someone, remember that your part is to simply inspire them by leading by example and focusing on your own personal growth. By being a beacon of light and hope to all those around you, we inspire others to join us on our conquest of becoming the best version of ourselves. Remember, you only have one life to live and this is your moment to get it right. As Bernadette Dimitrov quotes, remember that you cannot truly change anyone else. You can only change yourself. You either positively or negatively influence others by your example. Stay tuned, coming up after the break, I yeah. did see that you did the Tiffany's uh, song for Put Your uh, Head on My Shoulder for uh, Beyonce and Jay-Z. So talk to us about that experience. Well, TikTok, first of all, started. Yeah. You know, Put Your Head on My Shoulder is all over TikTok. Uh, you know, 40 million, blah, 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 a world I didn't know until they informed me. I mean, Jojo Cat, you know, she's had a huge hit with it. It's been all over the place and, you know, it, you know, they jumped all over it for that commercial. Uh, but that's nice, you know, I mean, I'm flattered to an extent. And uh, but I'm more excited about the fact that, you know, we paid the thousands of people in our concert. Recently, there were a bunch of kids down there, kids, you know, young people, 16, 17, 18 year olds running down to the stage only because of TikTok. And, uh, you know, it's part of that new life of a song that's been around for a long time. And the uh, the commercial that they put out, I thought was very touching because they're you know, they're good artists, they have good careers, and whenever your song lives in another fashion, you're very excited about it. Wardrobe provided by H&M. Next up on the show, we have iconic Canadian musician and writer, Paul Anka. Paul, oh, thank you so much for being on the show today. How are you doing? Well, thank you for having me on the show. I'm doing fine. I'm above ground, which is the main thing. <laughs> just finished a long tour through the East Coast, and I've just gotten back, and we're getting ready for the uh, the holidays. Very nice. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. I'm honored to have you on my show. I, I want to talk about, you know, everyone knows you as this music legend, but I want to take it back to the beginning of your musical career. When did it all start for you? Well, it started when I wasn't a music legend. I was a young boy in Ottawa, Canada, going to school. Uh, like all young people, I was navigating as to what I wanted to do. Um, I realized at one point, maybe around 13, 14, I wanted to be in the music business. Uh, thus, I took some music lessons and sang at school and, you know, tried to see if I could get any kind of attention, which I couldn't. You know, one has to realize back then uh, it was a... Uh, uh, you know, an environment of where music and the record business as we know it today was in its infancy stage and there were no young kids. Yeah. So anyway, long yeah. story short, I wanted to get to New York City to see what was happening because that's where the record industry was. And I uh, won a contest for IGA food stores, collecting soup wrappers, and they were going to send 40 kids from across Canada. Anyway, I won the contest in my district. I got to New York. I said, one day I've got to come back here. And uh, which I did, I think I was 15 years old and wound up in New York again and got an audition up at uh, ABC Paramount Records. Got very lucky and I was signed and they flew my parents down and that was the start of the dream for me. Yeah, absolutely. And let's talk about the Campbell Soup Contest. How do you think that kind of was, it started your, your path? Well, I think it just, it taught me that if you were confident uh, aggressive enough when people weren't believing in you that once you did it and did it yourself you were able to at that point in time uh, realize that if you stayed in that kind of a direction 
that it would kind of work out for you, you know, because you have to realize everybody in my business for years, and which I've observed, we're not born sophisticated. You know, we all came from modest backgrounds and, uh, you know, didn't know the way of the world. You get lucky because you have a gift and thus you get on this success road, which is very difficult to deal with for young people today, let alone back then. But you learn that at that point, you've got to really learn how to adjust to a lot of things. You know? And then you wind up in uh, Las Vegas with the mafia and the Rat Pack, and that's another challenge. <laughs> you know, what I love about you is that you didn't just sit back and wait for to be discovered. You know, you, you convinced your parents to go to LA, and yeah. I know that you called all the record labels that you could find. So how do yes. you feel that, you know, tenacity and determination kind of played a part in your success? I think it's important you know, for most people to have a self-confidence. It, it, it played, you know, a very important in, in my uh, in my success because nobody wanted to listen to me. You know, it wasn't Canada wasn't accepted as a as a music depot, if you will. You know, we we lived in the giant of the big elephant down here, and people weren't interested in Canadians back then. It was strictly just a few cities, so I had to be very tenacious and I had to have a lot of confidence and belief in myself to even be heard you know I'm a young kid running around with this silly little song I'm so young and you're so old and you're 15 <laughs> a pair of jeans and a t-shirt you know that wasn't the business and when I you know fade in fade out when I ran into the Beatles where I was responsible for them coming to this country you know they were you know they said to me we, we want to be like you are writing and publishing and producing your own music. So all of that was to come. And it was just the confidence that I had in myself to be able to be careful that I wasn't arrogant with it and stayed humble as my family taught me, but to really believe and be tenacious and convince people that had something they had to listen to. So I think it's very important for a lot of people, you know, and then you learn with it to stay kind and have empathy. And and because this business can really ruin you. It's a it's not a friendly business for those that are weak. Yeah, absolutely. And I like that you said that to stay humble, because I think, you know, success gets to a lot of people's heads and you can see that you're very humble, even though you've reached such uh, great success. So I think that's really important. I want to talk about what's been the biggest accomplishment for you that you think you're the biggest highlights in your career. The biggest highlights. Well, from the inception, you know, getting on Ed Sullivan and uh, Dick Clark, American Bandstand, not knowing if I'd have a career after that. Uh, and then accomplishing, you know, different levels of songwriting, but far most, the biggest accomplishment for me are, you know, my children and now my 16 year old son. I mean, uh, you know, you get a little older in life and you realize what really matters. And when I look back at, okay, you wrote my way and, you know, and all of this other stuff, but what I really get the biggest kind of kick out of every day and to where I moved emotionally is the fact that I've got five great girls and I've got a great son and a good family because in today's crazy world unfortunately until it settles down family is very important so those have been my best accomplishments for me the others the other stuff is just stuff you know there's mm -hmm. a lot of people like me there's a lot of people write songs a lot of people singing and you know, we just finished a great tour and a lot of people showed up and we were sold out and that was very nice. But, you know, there'll be somebody else after that. When you look at the accomplishments, it's got to be your family if you're lucky enough and successful enough to have a good family, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the pandemic really made people realize what truly is important, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think that's so important. I think a lot of people realize that their families and, you know, materialistic things are great, but at the end of the day, it's, it's it's really family and, and doing what you love to do, right? So I think that you're right. You know, it's so true and it's so easy to say. And I don't know that a lot of people they talk about it, but you know, the, they don't do the walk after the talk. You know, because a lot of the young people today, and I wish them all the success. It's a different music business. They would have too much too soon. Now, it's certainly equitable. You know, I had a paper out in Canada. I worked in my father's kitchen. He had a restaurant and. I made three dollars a week. So when I started making two hundred dollars a week, that was a lot of money, you know. Yeah. But you you do learn through the years that, and even with the pandemic, you know, obviously we got closer. That all that stuff, you know. I mean, I drive one car uh, through life. You know, I've had my little 
<laughs> sojourns into materialistic stuff through the younger years. But it really is just the stuff, and it doesn't keep you grounded to continue in what you're doing because you get you get caught up in it. You know, you really do get caught up in it, and it's tough today. I don't know how some of these kids do it. It's just overpowering because I don't know if they're intellectually prepared for it. You know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. You know what? The hard work that it takes along the path to success. I feel like that is really what grounds people and. At the end of the day, that's what makes you humble, right? Is when you go through all these hardships. I know you were also a journalist too before, you know, becoming a musician and writer. Like it's all those different steps, and you know, it builds humility and it builds a great work ethic. I want to talk about Frank Sinatra, "My Way." Like that is a huge song. Uh, let's talk about that song. I know a lot of people didn't know that you wrote it, so let's talk about that experience. Well, the experience itself is kind of encapsulated in knowing him for many years him and let's not forget Sammy Davis Jr and Dean Martin two great great performers who at the time you know for all of us young people who are starting out in a business that influenced the rest of the world you know England hadn't spawned anything until the Beatles and they copied us etc you know our idols uh, we looked up to were the rat pack and nobody could see past that nobody saw the beatles or hendrix coming thus we were looking at these three guys of great style and having fun that we wanted to be and you know when i got to a certain age realizing that i didn't know if i was going to last i wanted to work nightclubs i wanted to be working vegas where all the action was me bobby darren frank avalon you know that's all we thought about in terms of our vision so ultimately when i got there and became the youngest to work there I found myself in the midst of all of this loveliness that went on in Vegas and uh, <laughs> the carryings on, which you read about. And um, I got to know them quite well. They were all just wonderful to me. They were like mentors, you know, all three of them, more Sinatra and more Sammy Davis. And he was just a, a, a real amazing friend to have and an incredible artist because there's nobody that's ever done to the American songbook like he has. And uh, you know, when I got into Michael Bublé's life, because I knew he had a great feel for it, I was happy that someone like that would come along and keep it going. But back to Sinatra, he was just someone that I I couldn't believe what he was like in, in terms of being there for me. So through the years, he teased me. You know, I worked there with those guys for many years, and he'd say, "When are you going to write me a song?" But I knew he hated rock and roll music. You know, he <laughs> really hated it. <laughs> And uh, I said, well, you know, I don't know. I'll let you know. So anyway, a few years later, in the late 60s, we were all together down in Florida. And he had informed me, unfortunately, that uh, he was quitting show business. He was going to retire very soon. And he was doing one more album with Don Costa. Don Costa being my producer arranger for many years, who I introduced him to in the early 60s. And he said, I'm, I'm getting out. I'm tired. I've been being hassled. The Rat Pack's over, et cetera. So I said, wow. So I, I went back to New York where I was living at the time. 12 midnight, I'm sitting there. I couldn't get it out of my mind that uh, one more album, he was gone. And I started writing the words to this song, indigenous to his life. And about five hours later, I finished it and uh, called him in Las Vegas. And I said, I'm coming out. I've got something for you. He said, bring it. And I flew out next night. I'm in his dressing room. I sang him my way. He said, I love it. He said, I'll let you know. And two months later, he let me know. He called me up um, from Los Angeles to New York. And he played my way over the phone to me. I started crying. A few years later, I wrote Let Me Try Again, which he introduced to Madison Square Garden. And um, and that was it. You know, in a friendship, you know, right down till the day he died. And some of us can only dream of meeting Frank Sinatra. So what was he like? What was he like? Well, he's certainly a lot different with me. And... Uh, in the sense that when he liked you, he was a great friend, you know, and half the stuff you read about him, you know, I can't guarantee you there's any substance to it. Uh, he, he was an amazing artist and interpreter of song. Um, he had an incredible swagger about him that, uh, that was really affected everyone around him when he was there. And he was a performer that we'll never see again, you know. And a good sure. person, you know, he's a good person for me. You know, unfortunately, you know, you read different things and all of that, but so what? You know, you read about some of these kids today getting in trouble. It's profoundly different and just 
unacceptable. He, he was a man, you know, he was a man's man. And uh, I liked him a lot. I, I don't have a negative thing to say about Frank Sinatra. Yeah, that's amazing. And speaking of this generation of artists, I yeah. did see that you did the Tiffany's uh, song for Put Your uh, Head on My Shoulder for uh, Beyonce and Jay-Z. So talk to us about that experience. Well, TikTok, first of all, started it. Yeah. You know, Put Your Head on My Shoulder is all over TikTok. Uh, you know, 40 million, blah, 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 a world I didn't know until they informed me. I mean, Jojo Cat, you know, she's had a huge hit with it. It's been all over the place and, you know, it, you know, they jumped all over it for that commercial, and uh, that's nice, you know, I mean, I'm flattered to an extent, and, uh, but I'm more excited about the fact that, you know, we paid to thousands of people in our concert. Recently, there were a bunch of kids down there, kids, you know, young people, 16, 17, 18 year olds running down to the stage, only because of TikTok. And, uh, you know, it's part of that new life of a song that's been around for a long time. And the, uh, the commercial that they put out, I thought was very touching, because they're, you know, they're good artists, they have good careers, and whenever your song lives in another fashion, you're very excited about it. Yeah, I mean, Doja Cat did remix your song, um, and as you said, it went viral on TikTok. How does it feel kind of seeing this generation enjoy your music as well? Of course you're enlightened by that. I mean, the fact that, you know, people of different generations embrace music that uh, has a meaning for them, you know, it's not only my songs, there are other songs from other generations that have a life. It's a, you know, it's a great feeling for if you're a writer, and I'm a writer primarily, you know, I love entertaining, but I'm a writer and, you know, your songs are like your children and when they're accepted, um, you go, yeah, you know, because it, it seems to have the same message. You know, everyone's got the same blood in their veins and you really are elated when your music is accepted in that fashion. All the time. Absolutely. And Paul, our show is all about inspiration and showing success stories like yours in hopes to inspire our viewers, the younger generation, anyone watching. So I want to ask you, what's one piece of advice that you would share with our audience? Maybe someone that is not seeing their dreams manifest or want to give up on their dream. What, what, what piece of advice would you give them? Um, I would say be an accountant first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then I would say, you know, listen to yourself and not the last person that you listen to all the time. Uh, try and have a great belief in yourself. Don't get discouraged early mm -hmm. because it's uh, it's not the business that it was in terms of getting record contracts, stuff like that. And um, if you believe in it long enough and stay in the ballpark, you have a chance of making it. And if you're individualistic in who you are, you got a better chance. You know, if you're a writer, certainly more of a chance. But you know, just be careful you get involved with and realize that you can't trust everybody in this mm -hmm. business and you can't um, know that most people that you're with you know for a large proportion of that circle they don't really care about you so be very very careful and have your radar up and then just believe in yourself as a writer and doing the best work you can and remember that good is the enemy of great that's, uh, great advice. And I want to talk also about your current projects. I know you have a Christmas song coming out as well. What are you currently working on? Well, we have a Christmas album coming out. Mm -hmm. I'm currently working on my documentary, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, coming out hopefully next year. Uh, we're interviewing directors now. I'm planning another album for February. Mm -hmm. I'm working on a tour now of... Uh, for Florida and then March West Coast and then I'm coming to Canada. Planning my tour up there will be opening a gala show at Falls View in June. Uh, hope to be at Massey Hall, hope to be at Rama, maybe at the Montreal Jazz Festival. And I'll be around that area in June. So I'm working on that, uh, working on the completed album that's out now, the Christmas album, and uh, working on a documentary, which is a first for me. Uh, it takes a lot of time, a lot of time to research and go through 60 years of music. Yeah. And, and speaking of that, let's talk about Making Memories, also that album and some of the yeah. collaborations. Did well with that, you know, we were, uh, Olivia Newton-John, wonderful artist. Uh, she and I recorded Put Your Head on My Shoulder, mm -hmm. number one on Amazon and got a big reception. And, you know, I had Michael Bublé on there with uh, Buccelli singing My Way. And it was just an album of uh, a lot of songs that, uh, you know, when the COVID hit, 
I said, what are you going to do with yourself? I said, I'm going to do what I've done, but more of it since I'm locked in my home. And that is writing. And I started to write a great deal. And uh, I had an album and a lot of songs that were very meaningful. And we made a deal and we've put it out. And it's, it's done very well and continues to do so. So it's great, you know, when you're writing and then you're able to still write, which I do, you know, all the time. Uh, that gives you a great satisfaction because you never know where you're going to place it, what's going to come of it. And uh, that's pretty much what I've been doing, you know. And then, as I said, I have to really put some major work into the documentary. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Paul, for being on the show today. It's been such an honor. We're looking forward to having you in Canada, <laughs> back home. So that's very exciting. And again, thank you so much for everything. Dariel Roy, thank you very much for having me. Hopefully, when I come up in your uh, hood, uh, <laughs> together, we'll see each other again. And I thank you so much for the time. And hello to all my friends, all my fans up there. Stay safe, play by the rules, be well, and have a lot of patience because there's a lot of rumbling nuances going on in our world today. But, <laughs> well. Thank you so much for being on the show and enjoy your day and hopefully see you soon. Thank you. Tag TV is available on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple and Android TVs, as well as on Apple and Android phones. Watch us live through YouTube and Facebook.